What do you, or did you, want to accomplish by the age of 30? For many of us, 30 is the time by which we want to finish school, get married, get into our long-term career, maybe buy a house, uh, start a family. Well, Pete Adney had a different goal. By the age of 30, Pete wanted to retire. And he did just that. And he now has helped start a new and growing movement called the FIRE movement. That's an acronym, F-I-R-E. Financial Independence, Retire Early. It's a movement of people who are dedicated to reaching financial independence, which is this point where if you don't want to, you don't have to work another day in your life because you don't need the money. Now, for most of the people in this movement, the goal is not so much being able to do nothing in life, but being able to do anything, being able to do whatever you want without the need to have an income holding you back. And within the FIRE movement, Usually the goal is to reach this point in life, this point of financial independence by the age of 40. Though some even shoot for 35 or even 30. Now could you imagine being retired at age 30? Well, to get you there, the FIRE movement preaches two main principles. First of all, be extremely frugal. Save 50, 60, 70% of your income. Get used to living by on very, very little so that you can save a lot. And second, find ways to increase your income through side hustles or by accumulating passive income streams. Now, more and more people are trying to follow this advice and, and do it, especially young people. And many people, not a lot, but Many people really are starting to retire crazy early. Some of them are even reporting that they are retired in their 20s. Now, no matter whether you think this sounds like a good idea or a terrible idea, I'm sure we can all agree, at least on this, that this is a bit extreme. But it does actually illustrate something. It illustrates how many of us think about money. We see money as the key to freedom and control in our life. You even hear this in the language that people get used, or the, people, the language that people use when it comes to wealth and uh, being well off. We use language like financial independence, being independently wealthy, being a person of means, someone who has the means to do things. It's agency, control, freedom. That's what we're emphasizing. Because something within us longs to be free. We long to control our own life. And this is one of the reasons why money is so attractive to us. Money is the way to freedom and control in life. And we think that with freedom and control, we will finally be able to find happiness. This conviction, it, it drives us. So many of us are dedicated to making and saving money. We put so much effort into studying hard and getting good grades to get that good job after college. We put so much effort into working hard to make a good income. And then once we get money, we put all this energy into finding ways to save that money by being really frugal and pinching pennies here and there, or by finding ways to invest that money and make it grow. Saving and making money is for many of us a way of life. And before long, we end up feeling like money is the way that we assess our progress in life. That money is the way that we figure out how somebody else is doing. If somebody has a lot of money, we might say that they are doing well. And if they don't, we might say that they're not doing so well. We equate their financial well-being with their well-being. 
Wealth becomes the barometer of success. Making and saving money becomes a way of life. Does that sound like life for you? Well, have you ever asked yourself whether this life that so many Americans live, whether this life is worth it? Have you actually considered whether money is worth living for? Or have you kind of just assumed that it must be because that's how everybody's living and, and that's what they say you should focus on? Well, today we're going to consider some of the merits of the money-driven life. And as we'll see, our text actually is carefully constructed here. It's hard to see at first, but actually it's a chiasm, which was a common literary device in the ancient world. A chiasm is like a step pyramid. It's like A, B, C, B, A. So each topic gets addressed twice on both sides. There's a balance there, except for the central topic. And the central topic is being put forward as the main point. That's what a chiasm does. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to go up that pyramid together. We're going to start on the first floor by looking at the profits of the money-driven life. On the second level, we're going to look at the costs of the money-driven life. And then at the top, on the third level, the preacher is going to show us a much better way to live. So that's where we're going. Let's pray that God would bless our time in his word together. Heavenly Father, we come in need of your wisdom, in need of your word. We come in need of your nourishment, in need of new direction, in need of clear sight and stronger conviction in life. And we pray that you would help us this morning by your word to give us that direction to give us that strength and that hope that we need, that you would show us the way forward, the best way forward, and that you give us the courage to walk in that way to the praise of your glory. Speak through me, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's jump into our text and start exploring the first level of that pyramid, the profits of the money-driven life. We're going to start in chapter 5, verses 8 to 12. Let me read those verses for us. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Now the preacher uses the language of profit here in verse 11. What advantage or profit has their owner? But he works toward an answer gradually in this passage. He starts by pointing out the power of money in verses 8 and 9. Money brings power. And power brings money. So don't be amazed then when you see that poor people are oppressed. Because they don't have money and therefore they don't have the power they need to throw off that oppression. In part because the people who oppress them, the people with power, also have money. So the way the world works is that the rich and the powerful take advantage of the poor with relative impunity. Because if the poor try to get justice against some powerful person, 
powerful people will protect them. They are being watched over by other powerful people. Powerful people look out for one another. And in this way, justice tends to get perverted in our world. So one thing money can do is insulate someone in ways that perpetuate injustice. It's powerful like that. But money is also powerful and able to do good. If someone owns a field and they cultivate that field, that field will provide not only for them as their asset, but it will provide for the poor. Because according to the law of Moses, the poor had the right to go into that field and to glean whatever they needed to survive. The point is that money and wealth are powerful. They can advance justice in a society, or they can advance injustice in a society. And the power of money is really the thing that seduces us. Because money brings us power, even if that power is just in our life. But it can even, if we get enough of it, give us power over the lives of others. And we love that. We love having that power. And that's why nearly everybody loves money to some degree. But far too often, our initial fondness for money turns into something more, something more like an obsession. Once you start making some real money, you get a taste of that power that money gives you. You become enamored with money's potential. You start thinking about money more and more. And then eventually you find yourself head over heels. Before you know it, money is sitting in the driver's seat of your life. Money is is what's driving you. And you've become what the preacher calls a lover of money. Money becomes what you are defined by and what you think and dream about. It becomes your treasure. It becomes your God. It becomes the thing you praise, the thing you seek, the thing you live for. This is one of the great ironies of the money-driven life. We live for money so we can get freedom and control, so we can become financially independent. But this pursuit of freedom through money actually ends up enslaving us. To get control from money, we give control to money. It doesn't make any sense. But we do this willingly because we think that the profits are going to be tremendous if we do this. We think money will bring us freedom and control and power and that these things will make us happy in life. But as the preacher points out, and as scores of rich people will be happy to tell you, money can't buy happiness. Verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. The problem isn't money itself. The problem is deeper than that. The problem is in our heart. You see, money is just a powerful tool. It's a great tool. It's a blessing. The problem is when we have a perverse obsession with money. Something within us just loves money and is utterly convinced that money is the way to the good life. But our intuition that money is what we need, is it's just mistaken. Our gut is telling us to put our trust in something that is actually untrustworthy. We are trusting money to make us happy. But money cannot do So even when your income increases, you're still not happy. You still want more. You're still discontent. 
Is that not what's happened in your life already? Are you not now making more than you used to at some other point in your life? Well, are you genuinely happy now that you're making more money? Are you content? Or are you still looking for that next raise? Profits do not profit us. We think a money-driven life is going to take us to the promised land, but no one can get to the promised land but their money. The money-driven life is an empty life. It's vanity, says the preacher. It just doesn't bring us real happiness. In fact, the preacher says in verse 11, the only pleasure we derive from a money-driven life is the pleasure of watching that money pass through our fingers. Because you see, the more money comes in, the more money we get in our hands, the more money goes through our fingers. Money comes in, money goes out. As in income increases, expenses increase. So if you become wealthy, I'll tell you right now what's going to happen is that everybody's going to want a piece of your wealth. Your financial advisor, your family, your friends, people you barely know, but they're Facebook friends and they know you have money, nonprofits, oh, and the government. They're going to make sure to get your money, too. Because everybody's going to want a piece of the action. People are going to start mooching. They're going to ask. They're going to demand. In the preacher's words, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage, what profit has their owner but to see them with his eyes? When money flows in, money flows out. There are no lasting profits from the money-driven life. No matter how much you make, you won't be satisfied for long. And no matter how much you bring in, it will soon be eaten by others. We think money will give us control over our life, but our happiness is one thing that money cannot control. The same goes for sleep, the preacher notes in verse 12. The money-driven life is a life of anxiety about how to make more, how to keep more, and we end up losing sleep over this. We need to get up and write things down or look things up in the middle of the night. It affects our sleep. Meanwhile, the poor day laborer, the guy who gets oppressed, he at least works hard and at the end of the day, puts his head down on his pillow and he falls right asleep. Kind of makes you wonder who's actually got the better life. We see that again here in chapter 6, verse 7 the other half of this pyramid here on the first floor. Chapter 6, verse 7. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage, what profit, has the, man, has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. All of us, the rich, the poor, the middle class, the wise, the foolish, the old, the young, all of us toil for our mouth. We work in order to consume. You crave that sweet car, you crave that new phone, you crave that bigger office, you crave that nice house, those expensive shoes, and so you work and you work and you work until you can buy it. And then soon after you buy it, the craving comes right back. Only this time you want something else. And you work hard and you consume it 
and you're hungry again. The cravings never go away. The consumption never stops. Such is life. That's true of you whether you are rich or poor or wise or foolish. Nothing that you consume will fill you up. Your hunger will continue. Because what you are eating is air. You are striving for what is empty, for what is breath. You are chasing the wind. You're looking for contentment from money and from stuff, but money and stuff cannot bring you happiness. The money-driven life is utterly unprofitable. It is a wasted life. And it comes to us at a serious cost. We can see that from the second level of our pyramid, where the preacher shows us two tragic stories of what he calls grievous evil, really terrible situations, terrible stories, terrible outcomes, where these people give their life to money, and then they lose everything. Let's look at the first one. Go back to chapter 5, verse 13. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation, and sickness, and anger. This man was miserly. He was frugal. He was hoarding his riches. And it says in verse 13 that he was hoarding these riches to his hurt. It's an interesting statement. It implies that hoarding riches can hurt you. Did you ever think that? Well, this is actually one of the critiques that people make of the FIRE movement. Insiders make this critique. If you listen to stories of people who have been on this path trying to just really focus on retiring as soon as they can, cutting out everything, making lots of money, you hear them talk about how this impacted their relationships with other people, how their extreme frugality, which is really hoarding by any other name, made it awkward for their friends and family because they were so focused on not spending money. One couple writes, Our extremely frugal lifestyle took shape by cutting out almost everything we ever enjoyed. You name it, we cut it. But hey, we were going to retire early, so we didn't mind making necessary sacrifices to reach the fire finish line. But then something unexpected happened. As we watched our net worth climb higher and higher, we realized that our happiness level seemed to be in freefall. Hoarding riches really can hurt you. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but it seems to me that if good things are actually bringing you unhappiness, you've got a problem. But this is what happens so often when we let ourselves be driven by money. We become so focused on making money and then on saving money that we actually make ourselves miserable. Because this is always what happens when somebody worships an idol. If you give your heart to a good and not to God, that good becomes a source of grievous evil in your life. It brings you frustration, misery, 
heartbreak because no idol can bring lasting happiness. And every idol draws us farther away from the life that God wants for us. But it gets worse for this guy. You see, this guy, he'd always lived by the philosophy, pay now, play later. He made these sacrifices day after day to secure a great future for himself and his family. But then, with one bad investment, he loses it all. And now he's got nothing. He's got no savings. He's got nothing to leave to his son when he dies. It's shameful. It's embarrassing. It's a grievous evil to work all your life putting off your enjoyment as you hoard your money. But then you and your family never even get to enjoy it. It's tragic. What a waste. All this work, all this sacrifice for nothing. Perhaps you know someone who lived like this. Maybe their life ended unexpectedly, sooner than expected. And they had all this money that they had saved for their future, had given up so much, and yet never got to enjoy it. Now, in a sense, this is always how it plays out. See, no matter how hard you work in this life, you can't take your money with you into the afterlife. You have to leave your money behind. Your long-term rate of return on money will always be negative 100% if you're using your money to buy things here on earth. Because you, you cannot use money to shore up your future. Not your long-term future. You, you can't do that, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much money you make. It can't bring you long-term security. But what makes it worse is that all of this trying that we do, all the hard work we put in, all the sacrifices we make to save for the future, this really does cost us something. And the preacher focuses on these costs in verse 17 that this guy's money-driven life had led him to vexation. It took over his thoughts as he endlessly was trying to process what to do and what had happened and why things weren't working and why he was still unhappy. It led him to sickness. He was working himself to the bone. And it led to anger. He was angry because his idol was not delivering. Money wasn't bringing him happiness. It was only bringing him heartache and frustration. This guy felt cheated. He felt ashamed. He was angry at himself. He was angry at money. He was angry at the world. And the preacher says that this guy spent the rest of his days eating in figurative darkness. He was half dead joyless, just going through the motions, waiting for God to end his suffering and take him home. When money's in the driver's seat, it will only drive you to despair. Hoarding riches is not the answer. Hoarding riches is a big part of the problem. We also see this in the second story. Chapter 6, verse 1. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them. But a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off 
than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known, everything, or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good. Do not all go to the one place. This guy's also got riches. In fact, he's got it all. He's got wealth. He's got possessions. He's even got honor. He's got everything his heart desires, the preacher says. But he doesn't enjoy what he has. Because God does not give him the power to enjoy what he has. And so in the end, what happens is some stranger ends up enjoying what he has instead. Now that's an interesting statement here in verse 2. That, that God does not give him the power to enjoy these things. God is telling us that even joy in wealth and joy in possessions is a gift from him. And sometimes, we see here, God doesn't give someone that gift of joy. He gives them possessions, great possessions, but he doesn't give them the joy in those possessions. People can become so worried about their possessions. They can become so preoccupied with maintaining what they have that Sometimes people just can't sit down and enjoy what they have. Maybe you know people like this. Maybe you're one of them. This is often what happens when you finally buy that big house. Before you move in, you're thinking about how all that extra space is going to be such a blessing. But once you move in and you live there for a while, your big house can feel more like a curse. But now there's more to clean and more to maintain and more utilities and more property taxes to pay. You could have the house of your dreams and not really enjoy it. This too is a grievous evil, the preacher says. It's tragic for someone to have everything and yet get nothing from it. What an empty life. What use are blessings if no one is blessed by them? It's a great blessing to live many years. It's a great blessing to have many children. But if you have a hundred kids, and you live 2,000 years, and you are still miserable in life, what good is that? The preacher says that the unnamed, unknown, stillborn child who knows nothing of the good things of life is actually better off than somebody like that. Somebody who has good but cannot even taste their goodness. For unlike the stillborn child, that man will never rest in life, even though he's abundantly blessed. No unhappiness and frustration are going to plague that man for the rest of his life. Until, like that stillborn child, he too descends to the dead. Money, Wealth, these are blessings from God. But when you turn these blessings into your gods, when you let your life revolve around making and saving money, these blessings will ultimately become a source of frustration and disappointment for you. I mean that. Money is not the way to the good life. When money is in the driver's seat, money drives us to despair. But God offers us a better way to live. We can see that from the top level of our pyramid. Let's take a look. Here we see the good life that God wants for us. We see it here in chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. It says, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink 
and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is what is good, the preacher says. This is what is why. Enjoy today's blessings. Enjoy your meal. Enjoy your work. Enjoy the day. This is your lot. This is what God and his sovereignty has apportioned to you today. Enjoy these things. Count your blessings every day. And enjoy them. And if you can find enjoyment in them, thank God for that. That is a gift from God that joy that you're able to find in them. And it's a gift he doesn't give to everyone. Thank God for the gift of being able to enjoy his blessings. That's the good life. That's the life of wisdom. The life of wisdom is a life of contentment. It's a life of joy. Each and every day, the wise find something to savor and to thank God for because their focus is not on the blessings that they are missing, but on the blessings that they have by the goodness of God. Now that sounds almost like a secular perspective. It almost sounds like pop psychology, like some some meme on Twitter. But this isn't a secular perspective at all. In fact, this joy-filled life is utterly grounded in God. It is God who gives people the power to enjoy his blessings. And so if God doesn't give someone that gift, they can't enjoy their blessings. That's what happened to the guy who had everything. God gave him the blessings, but he didn't give him the power to enjoy them. So he wasn't actually blessed by his blessings. And his experience is not really the exception. It's the rule. Because you see... Our life, as the preacher says, is driven by this appetite that we have to consume blessings. We want stuff. And we want money because money will buy us the freedom to live the life that we want with the stuff that we want. So by default, each one of us lives a stuff-oriented, money-driven, self-centered life. But as we've seen, money cannot actually satisfy us. Any satisfaction it brings us, it's it's short-lived satisfaction. It, It quickly gives way to more cravings and more longings. What's worse, when money becomes our God, we sacrifice everything for it. We sacrifice relationships because they don't pay off in dollars and cents. We sacrifice today's happiness, believing that if we can go without today and save instead, then someday we'll be able to enjoy even more money. But this turns into hoarding, and it ends up hurting us. When you're a saver who hoards money or a spender who hoards stuff, what you find is that the more you hoard, the more focused you become on protecting your hoard on protecting your money and maintaining your stuff and keeping it nice. And this will start to take over your thoughts and your time. It will start to vex you. It will start to keep you up at night. But what will vex you the most is that when you have a chance to reflect on your life, what you'll recognize is that even with all that money that you have, even with all that stuff that you have, that you are still unhappy. You'll keep trying for a while, sure. You'll think that maybe the problem is you just need to tweak something in your life. But in the end, eventually, you will find yourself frustrated and disappointed. You will be outwardly blessed, but inwardly empty and joyless. Because you've gone about life in the wrong way. 
That's why we need God. The phrase, count your blessings, isn't enough to make us happy. It's not just a change in perspective that we need. We need God to rescue us from the money-driven life by showing us a better hope than money. When you realize that God loves us, that God loves you so much that he gave his son for you to die for your sins so that you could be blessed with the certain hope of his ongoing love and affection so that you could be blessed with the privilege of knowing him as your father, so that you could be blessed with the privilege of being a citizen in his great kingdom, to the extent that God lets you taste those blessings, you will discover that Jesus is sweeter than stuff. That Jesus is a greater treasure than treasure. And this, in turn, then, will let you see your blessings through a different lens. Knowing that your future is secure, that your future is going to be wonderful, you're going to be free from the anxiety of needing to make a whole bunch of money so that you can secure a great future for yourself. You'll be able to trust God to provide for you and even find joy as you anticipate the blessings that are in store for you. So rather than fixating on some earthly vision of the good life that you want and that you're going to work really hard for, you can instead rest in the salvation that Jesus has already won for you and focus on cultivating a more joyful relationship with God. And this radically changes, then, how you relate to money and stuff in your life as a Christian. Because now you understand that money and stuff, they're not the goal in life. They're tools, powerful tools, blessings. But they're not gods that we should sacrifice to. They are blessings from the God who sacrificed for us. The God who knows us. The God who loves us. They are tokens of his grace that we can thank God for and enjoy. So when you look at your home and your stuff and your account balances and you really understand those things in light of the salvation Jesus won for you on the cross, how great that is, how certain that is, you can focus on these earthly things these blessings that you have, and, and you can just enjoy them with a thankful heart. Rather than focusing on what you don't yet have and feeling so frustrated and discontent, or feeling so anxious about whether you're going to be able to get this thing that you need in the future. And this radical change in orientation where you stop seeking satisfaction from the world and you look to God to save you and to satisfy you in Christ, that is actually the key that unlocks joy from life's blessings. So that you can be blessed by your blessings instead of being frustrated by them. But the only way you can experience this joy is by giving up your old way of life. You must abandon your efforts to save yourself with money. You must renounce your misguided attempts to secure your own future. You must stop trying to rule yourself and instead turn to Jesus and trust him to save you. Ask him to lead you. Look to him to provide for you. Jesus is happy to do that for you. But for that to happen, you must really give your life, your future, your money, your everything to him. You see, Jesus taught us there are really just two ways to live. There's only two choices. You can serve the living God, or you can serve a false God. You have to serve someone, and you can't serve both. 
This is what he says in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So the choice is yours. You must choose whom you will serve with your one life. Most people choose to serve money. They try to rule their life. They try to secure their own future by focusing on making and saving money in life. They look to themselves to provide. But this also brings with it a lot of anxiety about whether they're going to be able to do that successfully, a lot of frustration at how things aren't going well. And in the end, it doesn't end up benefiting that person because no matter how much money you make, you cannot take it with you when you die. But they do it anyway. They live for money because this is the only way that they know how to live. It's the way that they see everybody living. It feels like what life is. But that's not what life is meant to be. And it's not the way God wants for you to live. Jesus offers us a better way to live. He says in Matthew 6, 31, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. If you will stop trying to provide for yourself and give up your money-driven life, You can follow Jesus instead. You can know God as your loving Father because of what His Son did for you on the cross. You can start tasting the joy of His kingdom because He'll welcome you into it. And as you seek His kingdom, as you learn to live under His reign according to His wisdom, you will discover that Jesus was right, that God will always provide what you need as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The message of the Bible is that Jesus is the way to peace. Jesus is the way to security. Jesus is the way to hope. Jesus is the way to the joys of heaven and to everyday joy here on earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise the name of Jesus Christ. He is our great Savior. He is Lord of all, King of kings. He is the one who offered himself to make provision for us. The one who leads us. And we pray that you would help us to follow him faithfully. We pray that you would help us to put Jesus at the center of our life so that we might find joy in knowing you and even find joy in the blessings you give to us. We know that so often we live with a secular perspective. We live for the world, like the world. And we also know that that isn't making us happy. We know that we need a better way of life. And we pray that you would help us to see that way and walk in that way. I pray that for anyone who is not walking in that way, that you would help them this morning to see that they need to change directions, that they need to center their life on Jesus, looking to him to provide, looking to him for salvation, not to themselves, looking to him for hope, not to their own ability to accomplish things and secure a future. Father, we know that you are the one who provides for us. And that you provide us with things so that we might enjoy them to the praise of your glory. We know that we are so blessed. And yet we also know that so often we focus on the blessings that we don't have. And that we don't give you the praise and gratitude that you, that you deserve from us. We're sorry, Father. Help us to be more thankful. Help us to find joy in our blessings.
Help us to keep you at the center so that we might see that these blessings are tokens of your grace. And that as we look at the money we have, at the resources we have, at the opportunities we have in life, that we might see those as good gifts from your hand and give you the praise that you deserve so that in everything you might receive the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name.